gosh, I love it. It rained last night. Matter of fact, technically, I think it poured. <laughs> I love the rain. My mother used to go out walking in the rain. She would throw off her coat and being in Southern California, we would actually kind of enjoy going out in the grass, you know, and it was all wet. The pavement had gotten wet and you could smell it. You could hear the rain pounding on the roof. I know there's some people that don't like the rain. And, well, you know, maybe you could take a lesson from what I learned in Ketchikan. You see, when I lived in Ketchikan, it was still kind of severe weather patterns. And since we have, like, global climate change, because I can't say global warming because people will argue, but everyone knows that the mean temperature in the northern climates has changed and that there's a difference in the weather patterns. I mean, you know, it's kind of obvious. <laughs> so denying it is kind of fun, but we're not into the politics of it about one way or the other, what caused it. We just know that uh, the ice is melting. <laughs> So don't go out on a flow because you might fall through. But the point being is that when I lived in Ketchikan, where it really doesn't snow much, you know, because it's on sea level and it's in the panhandle of Alaska, you know, it's kind of really on the Canadian continent. But it's part of the United States. I know some of you get that confused. <laughs> but when I lived there, what would happen is that during the summer months, there's beautiful sunshine. So people going on cruises would go to Ketchikan, your first port of call, and they would think, oh, how, or it used to be the first one. Now I think Haynes or something else might be. But they think, oh, how beautiful and how wonderful and sunny, and it always seemed to be. But then, right about September 15th, for those of us who live there, probably right around September 15th at night, <laughs> it would start raining and it wouldn't stop raining until May 15th. It poured, it was a, a rainforest on Rebelica Ghetto, which is the island that Ketchikan is on. It just poured and poured and poured. So it rained so hard that everyone who lived there had to learn from the natives. You know, and there's a lot of totems there, a lot of people that are famous for you know, carving totems. And it's a beautiful area. And it's just gorgeous because of the, the trees that grow there on the island. And most of the island is, it's not technically unexplored, but it's just not developed. People don't go back on the rest of the island. They stay on the coastal side. It's like one giant granite rock. But anyways, what we learned in, in uh, Rebella de Ghetto in Ketchikan is that as soon as it started raining, when it would come down just pouring, you had to learn how to walk between the drops. I mean, the natives did it, so we learned how. You could always tell the tourists because they would carry an umbrella. Well, in Ketchikan, because the wind blows, sometimes the rain is coming from this side, and then sometimes it's coming from this side, and it rains so hard it bounces up off the ground, so it would be coming from the ground side, and because it's coming down straight down, it would be coming from the up side. So it kind of didn't matter whether you were north, east, west, or south, or up or down. He had to learn how to dodge them suckers, you know, because they were coming from all directions. Whoa, oh, man. It was kind of wild. <laughs> but you learn when you live there how to deal with it. But you sure didn't carry an umbrella because the wind was always blowing, too. So I was always amazed, you know, when, you know, people would complain about rain because if you lived in some place like Ketchikan, it didn't do any good to complain about it. You know, a lot of times I find the same thing true in life is that people seem to complain about whatever their situation is. They either complain about too much sunshine or too little, too much snow or too little. They complain about, you know, the seasons. They come every year. <laughs> Spring, summer, winter, fall. Now, some places don't get as much of a different season change like California, but we still get some. In other places, maybe their seasons are a little different reversed or something like maybe Australia or maybe like if you're in Antarctica it's kind of like always ice but not quite as much as always ice as it used to be but complaining doesn't seem to accomplish much because if you're whining and complaining you're really not accepting what's happening which is in this case with rain God's refreshing the earth I mean if I put my plants out even though it's pretty cold they would suck up this rainwater, and man, they would just poof, explode with 
growth and amazes me because rainwater always, at least wherever I've lived, you know, has always produced such a phenomenal growth in plants. I mean, man, maybe it's just because how plants are so tired of getting tap water. <laughs> they just go, oh, good, God's water instead of tap water. So we gave up man's water for God's water. Kind of like the word, you know. A lot of times people, you know, they get complaining about different portions of scripture. You know, they, they whine about this part, they whine about that part because they don't understand it. You know, they don't understand the rain that's falling. So they say, oh, I don't like the rain. But they don't understand the snow that's falling, so they don't like the snow. Or they don't understand the cold that's coming, so they don't like the cold. It's always something, it seems like, that someone, somewhere, doesn't like about what God put in place. And sometimes that happens in the Word, where people don't like the fact that they don't know. So they invent what they don't know into what they think they know, and then try to run with it. And then they argue with each other about what they don't know. Now, what we do know is what God said. He wrote it. So he knows what he said, and he knows what he inspired people to write. And he knows what the answers are. Most people in the old days, unless you read some of the classics in a different light, if you looked really close, most people in the old days, they kind of went with this idea that, well, in the sweet by and by, God will tell us why, but until then, you don't know until you die. And that sounds nice, but it isn't scriptural. <laughs> um, it says that the deep things of God you know, are his own and some things are revealed to us that we should know and we could know and that we might want to know. I mean, Paul wasn't satisfied, so he went out in the desert and spent time with God, learning what he needed to do for God in order to be what God wanted him to be. So God even took him to heaven in order to explain to him the things that he was going to be writing about in the future. I mean, man, talk about a person who got a first-hand experience of what grace was. Oh, taken to heaven in order to talk to Jesus? Hmm, sounds like kind of an experience we ought to all try to do. Now, I'm not saying go out there and you know try to you know, kill yourself in order to get to heaven, but maybe you ought to spend a little time with God to find out if he could talk to you and you know, kind of straighten things out that maybe you got messed up. I mean, the other night I was spending, oh, I don't know, for some reason the Lord just had me keep going. And, and uh, even while I was going on and on with this person, I was thinking, Lord, why am I going on with this person? What do you want me to say? And they were telling me about Nephilims and angels and how they didn't believe this about God or how they didn't believe this about the Word of God. They wanted to state something that wasn't the way the Bible stated it. And I said, look, this is what the Bible says, and that's what I believe. The sons of God told the daughters of man and bore the giants of old, or bore the men of renown, or whatever. And so I kept saying, well, you know, the sons of God presented themselves before God, you know, and Satan was with him, according to Job. So that could be, you know, angels. But did I say angels? No, because the Bible didn't say angels. It said the sons of God, because I look in the book of Revelation, and I see that there are archangels, and they're called archangels. There are covering angels, and they're covering something. There are angelic beings that have like the face of a lion and the wings of an eagle and all these things that I don't know what that is. I mean, is that made up? No, it's not. In fact, it's an angelic being that, according to our understanding with what we look around right now, we say in this physical world, well, that's weird. That don't make sense. I don't like that interpretation. I think I'll make up my own. Well, no offense, but when you go to see a duck-billed platypus, I think you're going to get kind of confused about like, what in the world did God intend with that one? But it don't make much sense. Oh, you don't know what a duck-billed platypus is? <laughs> Look it up on Google. It's interesting. It looks like all the spare parts that were left over after creation got through together just to blow somebody's mind. Maybe the genetic uh, engineering kind of <laughs> confusion idea that people like to play with, ooh, maybe that's what happened. You see, whenever people don't like something, then they always have to work at what they want to make fit into a way that they like. It's kind of like when you're working in, on yourself. You know, you look in the mirror and you go, ew, I don't like that. So you start, you know, combing it, 
and you start grooming it, you start changing it, you start cutting it, you start tucking it, you start, you know, injecting it, you start rearranging it, and you start decorating it, and you start putting things on to hide it, you know, and you start covering it, you know, and you do everything you can to change it. I don't know about you. Maybe this may sound foreign to you, but maybe we could accept the rain for rain. Wow, what a novel idea. Maybe we could accept the Word of God for the Word of God. Hmm. Well, that's a strange idea. Don't you know that you need somebody to interpret it for you? Maybe we could accept God as being big enough to handle everything and we could ask Him about it. And when He doesn't tell us, we don't need to know. You see, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen, but it's also a means with which you accept by trust the reality that someone bigger than you are, smarter than you are, that has so much more comprehension than you, that created you, made you, and you don't have the brain cells or the capacity to handle everything that he knows. Really? Is that why we call him God and we're not? I think so. You see, the reason being is that man wants to make God into his image, where God made us into his image. So we're playing reverse order here. We're trying to put ourselves in God's position so that we can change, rearrange, or make fit what we want to believe about the Bible, as opposed to what the Bible says. So. I can look at that rain and it don't matter how much faith I have, I'm not changing that rain into anything but rain. You see, the rain in Spain falls mainly on the plain. A rain is rain as rain is, and a rose is a rose as a rose is. Now, I don't know, I didn't create the rain and I didn't create the rose, but you know, there are people that want to go out there and recreate roses into rain and rain into roses and call it by any other name except for what God said. Ooh, good luck. <laughs> I don't know, maybe if you're a scientist you could play with genetic engineering and come up with roses that look like rain and rain that look like roses. Good luck on that one. But it seems to me that every time people get into the scriptures and try to make something fit, like, okay, angels were like, you know, they were just duking it out, you know, and they were having a good old time with the daughters of men, you know, and so they had these Nephilims, you know, and they had this, that, and the other thing, and that they were doing genetic engineering according to the book of Enoch. Oh, the book of Enoch? You mean, you're jumping into things that aren't scriptural? Can I add some sci-fi to it, too? Can I put Frank Herbert in there? Can I put uh, Isaac Asimov in there? Can I add all kinds of other things, like Dianetics did with, you know who, L. Ron Hubbard. Ooh. And then in the end he said, well, you know, it really was a science fiction book all along. <laughs> but now we got a religion called Scientology. Oops. I boo-booed. <laughs> I didn't know they believed me. So you see, there is a problem with changing things because you don't understand them of rearranging things because you're trying to make something fit you don't understand. It would be a lot better if when it comes to the deep things of God, you accept what God says as opposed to what you think it says. One of the things that we're doing you know, in prophecy research and development is that we're addressing, and we just started it so I knew that somebody the very first day was going to confront me on some issues and sure enough that was a test for me to see if I would live up to word for word, lie upon lie, precept upon precept, accurately revealing the Word of God as the Word of God, the way the Word of God says. Because, see, that's the way that I do my Bible studies. I do them what I call IS, meaning that um, it is what it is the way it is. And I call it, not inspirational, but um, <laughs> I'm going to get into one of those pauses where I'm going, Boy, why doesn't my brain work as fast as it used to? Why am I not sharp as I used to be? It's clear. 
but in the way that it in insightful, not insightful, not inspired, not all those things, but it is it is where it is the way it is because God wanted it where it is the way it is the way that it's presented. In other words, accept the word the way that it's written where it is. Don't keep changing it because you happen to do a word study or get into a hermeneutic. That's not it. God uses it as it is where it's written. And I was trying to think of what I called that when I was doing Bible studies and teaching people to accept things the way they are. You know, and the nice thing about using the I dot S dot um, way of exegesis was that it was a by based upon the word itself, which I can't come up with the word. <laughs> it fit. <laughs> that means you accept it. And it was in and if you look up in the dictionary in, you know, you're gonna have a gazillion of them. So it's like, yeah right, put an I in with a star and see what Google gets you. Um, it is Oh well. As it's early morning and as I come up with it later, I'll probably mention it again because we'll be getting into Bible studies. But through prophecy research and development, we were talking about fallacies and how sometimes people take this point A and this point B and then they come up with a conclusion that's F. No, A plus B equals A plus B. I mean, I'm sorry. They are just two points that are two points. <laughs> Hello. You don't draw conclusions necessarily. You don't make things you know, added to what the scripture doesn't say specifically. Because what it does say specifically, you can read and it's, you can see that it answers itself within the scripture, by the scripture. That's how God inspired it, so that we could prove that he wrote it. Otherwise, when one man starts interpreting, every man starts interpreting. And I think that we'll get in problems when we start interpreting, don't you? I mean, who's the authority then? Everyone is. Because if one can do it, they all can do it. So guess what? Don't do it. Ooh, could be kind of like when it says don't judge lest you be judged for what measure you judge you shall be judged let's use a different word and say like how people are keep using that discernment thing and then they're always saying why well, you can judge because after all you're going to judge angels I don't think you're going to judge angels but I think you're going to commit judgment unto God who will judge the angels because you don't have the power to judge but anyways getting back to the point with what measure you interpret you shall be interpreted because Jesus said it to the young ruler when he said, you know, how do you look at these scriptures and how do you interpret them? How do you make it fit in your life? In other words, where are you coming from? What's your rap? How do you see it? You know? And that's why when people talk to me, they're always trying to say, what do I believe? Well, I believe in God. Now after that, it's God to determine what he said, not me. I don't have to determine what he said. He wrote it. If you have a problem with what he wrote, talk to him about it. I have a pretty easy acceptance of what he said. Now, I do tend to have to keep reminding people what he said over and over and over again. Which is why we have devotionals. Because you can talk to God. You can ask him, Now, Lord, you know, I don't really understand it, but what did you say? And what did you mean? Because even Jesus did that with the disciples. So, if he was willing to do it with his disciples, do you think he's willing to do it with you? I think so. So, Whenever you have a problem with something you're not really understanding and you're trying to tell other people that you're right and they're wrong, how about finding out if God's right and we're all wrong? Wow, <laughs> that's a novel idea. That's kind of how I do my prophecy stuff because I actually have a perspective that includes everybody's point of view. Ooh, wonder where I got that from. I wish I could say I invented it. But I think it's more of a big picture without it being universalism. How can you be inclusive without it being inclusiveness? And how could you be incorporating all people's perspective without being universalist? Simple. It depends on where they're standing and what perspective they come from. Let's just say that if you were standing on a mountaintop and you're looking down, it looks a little different than when you're standing on the bottom of the mountain and looking up. Wow, maybe that's where everybody gets the differences of opinion. Hmm, and you know, if the guy's not a mountain climber, he's not going up the mountain, so he's never going to see what it looks like from the mountain top down, and the other person isn't going to see what it's like because he likes standing on the mountain top, so he's not going down to the valley, he's not going to look up. Oh, so you mean the two shall never meet? Not really, they're always going to think they're both right. Because they are. Both could be right. 
based upon their perspective. Wow. You just solved the theological premise of denominations and non-denominations and people arguing for all of the centuries and eternity. Well, yeah, I know. I'm a genius. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Dream on. It's a matter of perspective. Get a grip. All you got to do is know where you're looking from in order to know what you're looking at. And when you come from God, looking at it from His point of view, it gets pretty easy to see. Draw near. How little man knows and senses me. How little men realize that I desire love and companionship. I came to draw men unto me, and sweet it is to feel hearts drawing near to me in love. Not for help, as much for tender comradeship. Many know the need of man, but few know the need of me. Few realize that I am the Lord your God, and I desire for you to know me in a way you've yet to taste of. Come, enter in to my fellowship, that we might share in what we care about, which is the love that God gave for both of us. You know, really, when you love someone, you're not worried about figuring it out, are you? You don't care so much about how or why. You just know how you feel. And sometimes, maybe, if you're really in love with Jesus, maybe the love is enough. What do you think? <laughs>